I just got a sheet of paper, a little co note card, right? We're going to start with this. Uh, on the card, if you grab a pen or a pencil, um, I want you to answer two questions. Uh, what is the best thing that we do here at Cedar Heights? Take a minute and think about it. What is the best thing that Cedar Heights does as a church, one of the programs, um, an attitude? What is that? And then on the same side, what is something that we should do? So what is the best thing that we do, and then what is something that we should do? So I'm going to talk today about vision in ministry and how Jesus um, modeled that within his ministry and uh, why it's important that we should follow that, but the steps that he took. So that we'll, uh, hopefully that we'll kind of know how, what to follow and, and why that's important. And um, so we're going to see how that goes. I don't know how long this is, so I'm going to try to book it on through. And if we get done early, that's fine. I'd rather go early than late, huh? Um, so Jesus' ministry lasted, I'm going to take this with me. Jesus' ministry lasted about three years, effectively three years. Um, he had a lot of training before that and a lot of time that he spent um, learning and preparing for his ministry. But three years of ministry, um, according to the Gospels, but in three years of ministry, he changed the world. Arguably, arguably the most uh, influential man in history it took three years to do that. If we followed his example in our focus in ministry and the things that we do, what can we achieve? I hope that we have a little longer than three years. It only, he only needed three. So uh, it's probably going to take us a little bit longer just to change our community, but we, we are capable of changing the world. Um, we're looking at this at kind of a business model, and I don't want that to throw you. You can look at a successful company and what they do and apply that to your ministry. We're not, I'm not calling our ministry a business, um, but they are practices that, that work, and they're practices that are honed, and that's why they use those. And uh, you, I made the argument, we're in the business of doing God's will, and uh, my brother-in-law, Chad, said, make sure that we're not calling it a, uh, that we're in a business for saving souls. We're not in a business, but it, I mean, that is what God's called us to do. That is our business. That's uh, what we're in instructed to do. Um, Jesus didn't follow a business model. Business followed a Jesus model, and I want to show you that, and we're going to look at Luke. So if you want to go ahead and open up to Luke 4, we'll, we'll do that. So has anybody written anything down on their card? You got some notes? Think about it, because I'm going to ask you to flip it over and do something on the other side. So as we're going, think about it and write something down. What's the best thing that we do? And then what's something we should do? And you can be creative with that. Maybe something's, it's something that you've thought about. Maybe it's something that you've seen, seen somebody else do. What's something that we should do? So why is vision important? Um, your vision should be concise, and this is from a business point of view. Your vision should be concise and give pers a purpose to your business. We're still looking at a business point of view. So concise means that we're, it's, it's very focused. It's very in one area, and it's not um, all over the place. We're not, if you're in a specific business for a certain product or service, um, you're not trying to service the entire board of, of everybody's needs. You're focusing on one specific need or a, a small subset of needs. Um, so it's, this is upside down now. You're being concise and you have a purpose in that um, you have a specific need that you're trying to fill, right? Your vision should be capable of motivating you and others in the business. So uh, the vision that you have should push people forward and give people a direction to go. The vision must provide the cornerstone of your business. Uh, helping you to link the actions to your strategic goals. Now the cornerstone, obviously this is a simple analogy and the construction guys in here will hopefully uh, back me up that I'm saying the right thing, but the cornerstone goes down first. Everything goes out from it. Everything is built on from it. It is your stability. It is the, the kind of the, uh, the first part of even the foundation. That's what, is that right? Does that sound good cornerstone is where you build out from. So your vision is your cornerstone, um, helping you link your actions to the strategic goal. So you've got what you've decided to do, and everything you do pushes towards that goal. You've got to have a clear understanding of the value 
that what you're doing will create. If you're doing things and you're not sure what they're going to achieve, then you're really unsure of whether or not you're doing the right thing. And you could be wasting energy. A vision provides clarity and purpose in your ministry. And I know that if, if I'm involved in something, in any sort of ministry, I don't want it to, to be futile. I don't want it to be uh, something that's not going to matter. I want everything that I do to matter. Um, drives every decision, both in what you do, but also in what you don't do. And I don't know if that sounds foreign to anybody, but sometimes uh, the vision and the goals that you set decide what you do not do. And we'll talk about that. Um, if you have limited resources, and we at this church are pretty familiar with having limited resources. Um, I know that pervades a lot of society and especially this church. If you have limited resources, how should those be spent? You want to hang on to everything that you have, but you want, when you do spend that resource, is it being used in the most effective way? And then what actions provide the most efficient means to achieve the goals that are set by your vision? Uh, so that you can target each step that you take, that you're making the, uh, the most efficient progress towards that goal. So you're not wasting resources, you're not wasting time, you're not wasting volunteers. And a, a vision will bring that in and push it forward. And I hope I'm doing a good example of ex explaining what a vision should be and why it's important. But let's look at it from a scripture point of view. How y'all doing on those questions? Any more? Doing all right? Okay. Um, open up to Luke, and we'll talk about five things that Jesus did that he uh, can teach us about following a vision, developing and following a vision. So Luke 4, but the first thing you do is define your core values. Uh, Jesus was very clear in what he believes and what he follows. He, he stands up for his beliefs. He even stands up against the supposed leaders of his own religion. And he does it time and time again, and he does it in a very firm um, but authoritative way. And defining those core values will allow you to uh, shape where you are and what you want to achieve, both to yourself, to those around you, and to the people that you're serving, your clients, but those that, that we're serving as a ministry. Um, I want to take you through a couple examples here. Uh, verses Luke 4, 1 through 13, the first part of that. You find Luke as well. Should have had this marked. This is talking about the temptation of Jesus. So one of the first um, places in his ministry that he defined those core values um, in a formal way within his three-year ministry was with Satan. The, the worst guy that he had to defeat was right at the beginning of his ministry. So I'm, I'm guessing Satan knew that something big was coming. Let me get on this right away and not wait till it builds up a little bit. Um, but he was taken care of. So we look at the temptation of Jesus, and I won't read all, all the way through this, but he spent 40 days in the wilderness, he didn't eat or drink, and Satan tempted him through that time. And the, the first temptation, if you were the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Now, I'm sure he's pretty hungry. Jesus said, I can make that stone bread. It's easy, it's something simple. Um, but Satan offered it to him, and Jesus answered him, man, it is written, man must not live by bread alone. It is written, man must not live by bread alone. Satan came back again and said, uh, look at all this. I've got all this world and all this splendor and you know, this authority uh, because it's been given to me. If I can give it to anybody I want, if you will worship me, all of this will be yours. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Um, Satan took him to Jerusalem. If you're the son of God, he took him up to the temple. Throw yourself down from there. It is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you. So, you know, Satan used scripture against Jesus and said, 
the angels will save you. You could throw yourself down and you're so precious that the angels will save you. Check it out, see if, it, see if that's true, see if it'll work. Um, Jesus came back and, and said, uh, it is said, do not test the Lord your God. So Jesus immediately used scripture to resist temptation from Christ. And that became his core value, or it showed his core value that he was going to live by Scripture. If you look over at 16 through 21, and I'll read this, uh, Jesus was rejected at Nazareth. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to, be free, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began by saying to them, Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. And I don't know how to do this gracefully, but I thought it was a pretty neat image. Uh, Jesus went to the temple right in the heart of the Jewish faith and revealed his purpose in the Nazareth synagogue where he grew up by ancient scripture. And basically <laughs> read the scripture and said, this is it, I'm right here. That's all he said. And uh, the only vision that came to me was, the only image that came to me was like a rock star, just you know, right at the end, I'm, I'm it. You know, Jesus said, I'm right here, drops a microphone, walks off stage. That's about what he did. Um, but I thought that was really cool, and it took guts for him to say, uh, you know, this is scripture, and I'm it. That's a core value that he has brought out and said, um, I'm not gonna be afraid. I'm going to go boldly, um, into the world and proclaim what is the truth. Now, um, over to 40 and 41. Let's so skip right past it. He humbles himself by silencing demons who were trying to exalt him. On 40, when the sun was setting, all those who had anyone sick with various diseases brought them to him. As he laid his hands on each one of them, he would heal them. Also demons, were coming to, also, demons were coming out of many, shouting and saying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because he knew he was the Messiah. And that shows a humility that um, he didn't necessarily have to show. He had full right to show that he was um, almighty and that he had the authority within him. But early in his ministry, or near the beginning of, the min of his ministry, he had the humility to say, um, this is not the right time. I know you guys are demons and you're still worshiping me, but let's keep it on the down low and you know, we're not going to make a big deal about that right now. With all these people coming to him by just the words that he, was spoke, that he had spoken and the deeds that he had done, they were coming to him with their sick, saying, please heal these people. So he's, and there's lots of other places, and I want to be clear um, that these scriptures hold a lot more um, in, in them than what I'm bringing out right now. They're just examples of the way Jesus has used this process. Um, they, they mean other things as well. So, um, but he's defined his core values in the beginning of his ministry and says, this is where I'm going, and I'm not going to waver from it. Um, so that's step one in, in finding the vision for your ministry. Step two is to build your team. You've got to have people around you, good, sharp people that, that know what they're doing, not so sharp people that are there willing to help. You need a team to help you. You can't do it all by yourself. So Jesus did this too. Building your team as the second uh, step in defining what your vision is and following your vision through ministry. Uh, Jesus built disciples and, and he spread them out. He didn't keep them all right here. He didn't say, okay, I'm going to have my hand on you. He taught them and sent them out. If you look at Luke 5, uh, 4 through 11, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down in, uh, your nets for a catch. He didn't know Simon, uh, Simon at the time, or they weren't uh, connected. Um, Jesus had been speaking. But Master Simon replied, we've been working hard all night long and we've caught nothing. 
but at your word I will let down the nets. When they did this, they caught a great number of fish, and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled both boats, so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, because I'm a sinful man, Lord. For he and all those who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish they took. And so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's partners. Don't be afraid, Jesus told Simon. From now on you will be catching people. Then they brought the boats to land, left everything, and followed him. Uh, Jesus showed his power and showed what he was capable of, led by example, and brought in followers. He went out there and... uh, began his ministry, showed that he had authority over nature, and those guys were so scared of him. <laughs> Simon wanted him to leave. Like, don't be around me because I'm not even worthy of being there. And Jesus grabbed him and said, no, you're coming with me because of your humility. You know, I can work with you. And because you guys believe in me, let's go change the world. Look over at 27 and 28. And uh, Jesus called Levi. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So leaving everything behind, he got up and began to follow him. Um, If you read on, it talks about dinner with Levi. And and as growing up, I, I never really thought about a tax collector and his surroundings. And, um... I always thought of a tax collector as as the Ebenezer Scrooge, sitting in a miserly old hole, dirty with no friends, and counting his money, and the the snide jeer on his face, and the loud cackle or something like that. But um, Charlie's preached on this before. The tax collectors would actually cheat people out of money, and it was a despised position, but it was sought after because they made money. They were... Uh, rich people. They weren't necessarily fully respected people, but they were respected within the Roman community, or they at least had the high people um, that they could hold dinners and banquets and parties with. Um, But within the community, they they weren't well liked. I don't know that you could compare them to politicians of today, but maybe the corrupt ones. Um, But can you imagine, uh, well, this is Levi, a tax collector. Jesus came up to him, worst of the worst, or one of the worst, uh, Jesus came up to him and said, follow me. That was it. He didn't make him catch a lot of fish. He didn't save any, you know, bring anybody back from the dead. He said, follow me. And Levi got up and said, Whoop, this guy, guess, guess he knows what he's talking about, and walks away with him. But invites him over, if you read further, invites him over to his house um, and provides a, a dinner for him. Jesus went. So this was a very big house. He had a party with a lot of people there, um, So he had a lot to lose, is my point there. Levi had a lot of money, had a position that he could make a lot of money, and stepped out and followed Jesus because he told him to. If you go to chapter 6, verse 12. So talking about the 12 apostles. And, uh, I mean, it names them off here. And he went out, picked them out of his followers, and said, you guys are going to be special to me. Um, He chose 12 fine gentlemen chose a core group that he could teach and follow out. So not only has he demonstrated his love, or his power, um, not only has he called people blindly because he saw something within uh, that person, because Levi became Matthew. And Matthew um, wrote the first book of the gospel. So, I mean, that's nothing too shabby. Um, Jesus took those 12 and really taught those, and we'll talk about those, that later, um, to be his core group of people that will take over when when he's done with his ministry. And then the last part of building your team, if you go to chapter 9, verse 23, I didn't use my Robert Furry joke. I was going to say click in your Bible because he came up with that and I thought it was funny. Apologies, Robert. Uh, Verse 23, Then he said to them all, If anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Uh, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. And he goes on. 
if you look through verse 27 in that whole section there, it talks about the commitment and the sacrifice that it takes to follow Jesus. Now you can look at that. It takes a commitment and a sacrifice to, to put yourself into a business and go all out for it, um, especially as a core member and one that really has a stake in it. But if you have a stake in your ministry and if you have um, you want to make a commitment to get it to go further, you can't just show up five minutes before it starts. You can't um, be there every other time that something happens. You need to dig in and make a commitment and follow. And that goes beyond, uh, say, a leader or initiator of a ministry. Um, I mean, it's for the team as well. Uh, he, this wasn't I'm going to say this, I'm not really sure, um, wasn't necessarily for the 12 apostles. This was for any, it was for the people walking behind him as he taught. He said, if you're going to follow me, you're going to take up your cross and follow me. So there was a deep commitment. It was leaving your possessions. It was being persecuted. It was standing up for those core, devout, core values that you defined early on. Um, but it definitely takes a commitment to get going. So that's building your team. Define your, define your core values and build your team. Then you set up a focus group. That sounds kind of funny. Um, Jesus was in constant prayer with the Father. Uh, you know, he talked to God every day, um, and I, I'm absolutely sure that that defined the steps that he took along the way. Um, but bathe your ministry in prayer, that you'll always know what works. You'll always know how to shape your product, what the thing that you're selling or serving. And that's Jesus' love. And that's um, winning souls for him. That's uh, caring for people. That's all those things. That whatever you are doing within your ministry, if you bathe it in prayer, God can tell you um, what your steps should be. Your instruction manual is right here. Um, it's, it was kind of easy for him uh, to take that stand and to follow through um, because he had that direct link with God. But he tells us that we're capable of that as well. Um, you can talk to others, experts that have advice. You can talk to um, people that, from other churches that are doing things. You can talk to your peers to make sure that, that they know. But it all ends up coming back to God and what uh, his purpose for you is and what his desire for your next step should be because he's the one that knows. When you're asking those other people, um, the hope is that they're praying and that they're uh, learning from God and from Scripture what the next step should be. Um, you should always ask those that are spiritually smarter than you because hopefully they've studied that thing. Okay, so define the core values, build your team, and the focus group. Clearly state your goals. It seems kind of a... Uh, a thing that shouldn't, you know, it should be unsaid. You should state your goals, obviously. But a lot of times you don't within a ministry. I know I've, I've been, uh, you know, I'm in charge of the media ministry, and there's been times where I said, I don't, what are we doing? Why are we here? It's cool toys for us to play with, and we got stuff to do on Sunday morning, but why are we here? What should we be achieving? Um, beyond just the couple of things, uh, we've got to have our goals, and we need them clearly stated for a couple of reasons. You, you clearly state them to your team, to your client, which is kind of the church members and those that we touch, but also to the public, those that we're reaching out to, so that when um, something happens, they know your team knows where what decisions to make. If they can't get in touch with you, they know where you're going, and we can all kind of um, end up in the same place without. Uh, especially when you have a larger team or a larger ministry, this section over here may be trying to do one thing, and this section may, over here might be trying to do another thing, and you're clashing at certain points, or you're using up resources that, that each other, the other side needs. So if you look at, uh, we're back in 9, at the very first verse, 1 through 6, uh, summoning the 12, he gave them power and authority over all the demons and power to heal diseases. Then he sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he talks about, um, he gives them some specific instructions on, on how to go out and do that, talking about not taking money and not worrying about where you're going to go. He tells them don't take a walking stick uh, for protection. 
Um, that's a lot of faith. Don't take an extra shirt. That's pretty, that's pretty good. Uh, but I can't imagine going anywhere without an extra shirt, just something packed. Um, but he commissioned the twelve with a clear example of, or clear directions, and he shows us that that um, he gave them power over the demons and power to heal diseases. So he said, proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. That's pretty much it. He gave them some tips on how to get there, um, but proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. And we've got a great commission that uh, Matthew twenty eight nineteen through twenty. Um, but we've we've got clear directions from Christ what we're supposed to achieve. So you within your ministry should have clear directions for your team and for your client and for your public so they know where they're going and what they should expect out of your ministry and uh, how you use those things that you're allowed, the resources that you've got. Um, I think this is right. Luke 6, 21. Oh, no, no, no. Luke chapter 6 is through chapter 21 is all of Jesus' ministry. All the times that he took his disciples and the people that he was with, he took them with him and taught. Um, and it's on-the-job training. It's as simple as that. You have on-the-job training with his disciples to prepare them for a time without Jesus. So there's going to be a time, Jesus knew there was going to be a time without him, and he prepared them several times and, and uh, prompted them a few times to say, you know, I'm going to ask you some questions. What's the right answer? And Inevitably, they had it wrong or slightly off, and he had to correct them. But he was always uh, teaching them while he was preaching to the public. Uh, they always had a ministry target. I'm sorry. As he was preaching to the public, his disciples was his ministry target. He was showing them by example how to teach and how to bring uh, people to God and how to um, bring them to salvation. And then he would speak to them privately and show them. And they even had to tell him once, teach us how to pray. He showed them by example, but he had, they had to pull him in and say, you know, we want to learn how to pray. Um, so that, does that make sense? On the job train. Okay. Then uh, the final thing that Jesus did to... Um, create a vision and pursue that vision was don't do anything that doesn't involve your mission. There, this is where we come back to uh, the choices of things that you don't do that you, decided, that you decide not to. And this is a tough one for a lot of churches and this is a tough one for me. It's a tough one for I think some of the things that we do is what do we don't do? And when you define your goals and your core values and where you want to go that should be an easy question. It should be an easy answer. Um, because if it doesn't line up with what our mission is and what our goals and what our stated um, vision is, we don't do it. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, Luke 4, 43. This is where Jesus declined to spend time with the crowd so he could visit another town. So he was preaching out in Galilee and went up and made his way to the desert, deserts, but the crowds were searching for him. And they asked him to, come, to keep uh, teaching them and, and not to leave him. And he said, I must proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because I was sent for this purpose. So if you look at it, <clears throat> Jesus said, I'm sorry, I can't teach you anymore, so I need to go teach these guys. So these guys were more important than these guys? Were they? Not necessarily, but they had heard it. I was sent to spread the gospel, is what he was saying. I'm, I must go out and teach other people as well. He was preparing his team so that everybody could be hit, but he declined to stay and didn't do something so that he could go do what he was sent to earth for, really. That's a good question. Is why was I sent to Earth? And that should define you personally, where you should, uh, what you should and shouldn't do. Um, chapter six, verse one through five. This talks about the Lord. Um, well, the, it was disciples were eating um, on the Sabbath, and uh, they were, um, they were 
picking grains off and that was considered work back then. But Jesus uh, said the man-made laws of the Sabbath aren't going to stop him from ministering. You know, he heals on the Sabbath. He, um, they, they did things on the Sabbath that were traditionally by Jewish law uh, defined as, you, as illegal. You don't do that. And Jesus said, you know, looking at his core values, what the scripture says, said that's not important. I can't let this guy be sick and die on this, just because it's the Sabbath. That's not what the scripture meant. Do no regular work on the Sabbath and keep it holy. It's, he looked at his core values and said, um, that's not going to stop me from doing what I need to do. Uh, chapter 9, and I like this one a lot. It's not my favorite one. My favorite one's next, but chapter 9, 61 through 62. in a whole page. Sorry, I can't thin Bible pages. 61. Uh, another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go and say goodbye to those in my house. But Jesus said to them, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And that happens a couple of times where, let me go bury my father. You know, let me go do this real quick, and then I'll, I'll tag along. I'll just catch up with you. You know, what town are you going to? Um, Jesus said, no, you're walking with me right now, or you're not going. And it has to do with commitment, but you don't look back and push ahead. And you don't do things in the past, because that's what we've always done. Not necessarily. Sometimes you do. We always have Sunday. We always have Wednesday night, because that's a good thing for us to do. But we don't do something simply because... We did it in the past when we're trying to move ahead into the future. And we should always be moving ahead with, with Christ. Um, he always pushed further, and we should be doing that as well. Does that make sense? Does anybody have a problem with not looking back so that we can move forward? So that's one of my favorite ones. And I learned that early with a, a, a cool ministry we did at the church that I grew up with um, that just wasn't working anymore. Um, it was a little outdated. The participation wasn't there, but it was one of the coolest things that we had done, and it was hard for a lot of people to let go. And as a, oh gosh, a fifth grader, a sixth grader, I learned that lesson that you don't hang on to things just because we've always done it and it used to be really nice. Um, if that's holding us back, we, we move forward and we do something new, and we find what that goal was and we achieve it in a different way. Verse 20, or sorry, chapter 24, right at the end of Luke, verse 1 through 3. 24, 1 through 3. It's my favorite part. Don't, do, don't let anything get in your way. Resurrection morning. Jesus didn't let death get in his way. He died and came back to life to finish his ministry. I don't know if any of us can do that. But that's how strong he felt about his ministry and that he had to finish it. So death didn't even stop him. That's all, that's all i got to say about, about that one because I just really like that. He didn't let that stop him. So to recap, the five things that Jesus taught about vision is define your core values. Make sure you know what, you're, what you believe. Build your team. Get your help out there. Focus group. Make sure that you, as you're going, you're doing the right thing and you're, you're bathing it in prayer so that you know um, that you're on the right path. Clearly state your goals so you know where you're going and others know where you're going. And don't do anything that doesn't involve your mission. Stay on your path. Keep moving forward. Now, if you take out your cards that you got and flip them over, after listening to that, and I hope that that, uh, that got you somewhere, it made sense and it was correct, and uh, God was saying, like, right on, that's, that's pretty good. I would have said it better, but you're fine, Carrie. Um, on the back of your card, what should our vision as a church be? Just write in your own words, what should our vision as a church be? It could be something simple as, what do we need to achieve? It could be a statement that you, you think that just comes to your mind, but what should our vision as a church be? 
Um, some final thoughts are, when you have a, a clear vision, a third party can come into your situation and understand what you're, you're trying to achieve. So it should be clear enough that, um, as a church, our vision should be clear enough we should get a new pastor and he knows exactly where he's going to fit in. We should pick a pastor off of our vision so that we as a congregation, uh, I'm not trying to push you out or anything, but we should be able to, as a congregation, have a vision that uh, we pick the pastor that has that same vision that is ready to executively push that forward. Within your, a smaller ministry, if you get a new job and have to move out of town, that that ministry continue, can continue to strive because someone else can step in and say, ooh, yeah, this is what we're going to do right here, and that'll work. Um, your, your partners in ministry are able to understand the same finish line without spending the valuable time and resources on things that aren't going to work, other tasks. So that when you're looking at money, you're looking at volunteer time, you're looking at facilities, your team members are able to make wise choices about where you're going to go and you're not having to micromanage everything. So that vision will help you uh, help them achieve that. Now, you can change your vision. It's okay. And there's, there's a time when a lot of churches and even businesses will say, okay, it's five years ago or ten years ago we had this mission. We're going to change that right now. Um, you, you know, the, the hot topic right now is Apple computers. And um, you read a lot about what they did as a business model. started out with computing. And they went into, you know, when they were struggling, they changed their vision to uh, personal information and music and providing a simple experience, and it was really a life experience. And they changed their vision to supply that new need. It was new technology that really spurred that. And we're the same way as a church and as specific ministries within the church that um, when new things arrive, maybe we get a, sep a different kind of people or, that are living around us or new, you know, we built a building and had new families coming in. Our visions need to change to, say, smaller children or small families or how, how are we... Um, meeting those specific needs, and maybe those needs change over time, we can change our vision. Um, once, once it's been changed, do the new thing. Don't keep the old outdated practices just because they're nostalgic. Um, we have to stop the old things that don't work and start the new things that move towards our, our goal. And that's hard. It's really hard for a lot of us that, that like doing specific uh, things, but uh, if we need to evaluate them, and even if we need to change them where they're kind of the same, but they, they achieve what we are wanting to do, um, we have to do the new thing that matches what our vision is. And, and that doesn't, uh, the neat thing about that is this never changes. This never changes. Our goals and our core values shouldn't change because they're coming straight from Scripture. But our methods of attaining those goals and the process by which we, we do those things should be flexible enough um, that we can make it work. Does that make sense? Okay. So my question for you, my, this is discussion time, and I hope that somebody's ready to say something. Does focusing in one area dismiss other areas of ministry that might be important? You can just shout it out, because I'm not leaving until we talk about it. Just focusing, say, um, in building strong families, because we've got a lot of young families um, in our church because of Awana or you know, daycare and academy. We're bringing those families in. Just focusing on that take away from other areas? It shouldn't. Okay. How do you say, what do you, why do you say it shouldn't take away from those areas? Okay. So if those other areas have been given us to by God, given to us by God, then. Um, he should take them away if that's his. Okay. That's a very good point, is that God has given us that purpose, that this is, God has ordained this focus. So these aren't necessarily going to, it's not going to be a bad thing that we're not focusing on these areas. 
you really, and I agree with that, but um, as a church, that's what we're building. We are, um, we feel as a church that God has directed us in this direction, and that, making that one area stronger, can infiltrate everything else. And that, as we grow those families, they may turn into professionals, older families, that that becomes our focus, and then our vision might change. So we as a church have a specific calling from God. Other churches have theirs, and that's okay. That we are in our area with our uh, members and our skill sets for a purpose. God's put us here. We're not a summit. We're not a new life. We're not an Emmanuel. We're not a Tallywood. But we have our purpose, and we have the things that we're strong at, and we can have those. Now, I'm not saying we don't have a youth ministry, or we don't have um, other areas where people are, because we need to minister where those people are, but how are they, how, do our, how does our focus encompass them and um, push forward in one area? But we don't have to have every little ministry that everybody, every other church has in order to achieve that. Paul sent out other missionaries for specific purposes. He uh, sent out the people that he grew and he uh, taught and would take along with him on ministries and say, okay, you're ready, you're ready, let's put you together, and you go over here to do this because I can't get over there. I don't have time. I'm, you know, if you, back in the day, they had to walk every place. And that's the broad that's the broad standpoint. But they maybe it was um, to turn them from an idol and that was taking over in that city or well, know, whatever that is. So. Sure. Right. Well, that's not what I'm saying is, is giving them things to do. It's talking about being in following scripture, following prayer, and in your ministry. And what I'm showing is that the business world didn't make this up. Jesus did this. Jesus you know, followed you know, through this. Jesus didn't, didn't uh, have vision for his ministry and he didn't follow through. He was, he was doing the will of right, and this is, these are the steps that he did that we can do to, in order to uh, have the same sort of success in ministry. And I, I believe that a lot of what we, the problem with the church is we don't know where we're going to go. We come to church because if, well, if we're supposed to come to church. But he doesn't use them blindly, and that you know there there's something to be said for a personal relationship, and it's the most important. And you can do that and get your uh, your call from God. But we as a church and we as a structure, 
have to um, use those and we have to be organized within that and that's what I'm talking about is having organization and 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 walking forward so it's all you're saying it's all gift oriented okay no I, I mean I believe that you you use your gifts for God but God can also take those um, you know, I'm not a gifted speaker. I'm not a gifted preacher, but I'm up here sharing uh, God's scripture with you. Or say someone's not a gifted singer, but they're up here in the choir. Um, God can use you without gifts, and that's a part of it as well. Well, I, I mean, I, I agree with that. I agree people use their gifts, and I use my gifts on Sunday mornings. Do what? I said, you got to agree with that. That's God's word. Sure. But I also know that Scripture says that, if you, uh, that God will use you where you are, and God will use you um, even if you're not gifted at it. But, uh, you know, but you're saying it, no matter where you are, that's where your gift is. No. Because you say if you're working no. somewhere, that's where your gift is. Wherever God, wherever you may be, if you're going to produce the shop, you can use that gift. God can use you in that, in that gift there, wherever it may be, whatever you're doing. Okay. But you disagree with being organized about how, how you go around and, how, and seeing where you're supposed to go. And that, Henry, that, that's my attempt, is to show that Jesus modeled this. That, that I'm not taking it straight from business. To show that Jesus took these steps in order to make his vision, and well, his ministry strive. And that's what we should follow. If this were strictly a straight step, step, step business model, um, that wouldn't be correct. But showing that Jesus did these things. And I didn't take this verbatim from a business, um, you know, a business paper or something like that, a publication. Uh, you know, these matched up with Scripture, and we t took it through Luke so you could see a progression. We didn't skip around in Gospels so that we could see Luke, you know, his description of Jesus' ministry went from here to here to here to here to here. And these are the sections that, that sure, they, they match the business model of what might happen, but Jesus did this. Jesus walked through these. That's what I'm trying to show, is that it's not a business model. It's a Jesus model. And, it, you know, I'm open to discussing it with you, and, and I'm not trying to present it as a business model. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Well, and if you, we've talked about this in our, in our small group class. If, uh, 
If you get down to the nitty gritty, programs aren't spiritual. There's no programs in the Bible. There's no awanas where they have a structure and they talk about here's you know what you do next. There's no RAs. There's no um, Sunday school. There's no Sunday school. There's meetings and they they get have Bible study where they study the scriptures together and they discuss what's what what things are happening and what happened in Jesus' life that we can use. But um, so I mean there is some modernization to the church, um, but I feel like setting goals and having a, a, a straight place that you go go in ministry is is Jesus led, if not apostle led. Well, here's two things. Not everybody's going to be in God's will, and that's, that's just the way it is. I agree with that. Not everybody's going to be in God's will, but you cannot be complacent because you don't feel like you're in God's will. Because God says, you know, go. He will guide you along the way, but if you're standing still, you're not going anywhere. So if you go, and then God can lead you where you're supposed to go. If we go as a church and we're going the wrong way, He should take us down. But if we are moving, God can direct us in the right way. So I agree with you that nobody, not a, a big part of the church is not being in God's will. And Jesus set up, or God set up Israel in a format that He was the King and He was telling people um, beyond the Levites, the the. Uh, what do you call them? The you know the lead, the spiritual leaders. There was no structure. There was no king and no government, uh, because he was the government. And but that didn't work for them. And we're doing the best we can. Yes, sir. I think one of the important 